I still thoroughly believe at the heart of all of it, it's if the work is really well done, like if you studied, if you've worked hard, if you understand good design, composition, interesting subject matter, that most of the time I feel like will carry you through a lot of those hard times. And then all the other stuff, it's still important, but it's not as important as that. Welcome to the Bold Brush Show, where we believe that fortune favors the bold brush. My name is Laura Arango Bayer, and I'm your host. For those of you who are new to the podcast, we are a podcast that covers art marketing techniques and all sorts of business tips specifically to help artists learn to better sell their work. We interview artists at all stages of their careers, as well as others who are in careers tied to the arts in order to hear their advice and insights. In this episode, we interviewed Derek Harrison, a figurative artist based in Santa Barbara, California, who specializes in dramatic figurative and landscape paintings. We discussed how he went from tattoo artist to figurative painter, as well as his transition from student to working artist. And we also talk about how he uses social media and other ways in order to maintain a good rapport with his collector base. And finally, we talked about a really exciting exhibition happening at the Samagandhi Club called Americans in Paris Fashion, where he will be displaying four of his paintings, as well as he will be teaching in May at the Los Angeles Academy of Figurative Art, where anyone is welcome to join. So, welcome, Derek, to the Bold Brush Show. How are you today? Oh, good, Laura. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm happy that you're here. And uh, I'm kind of jealous because it's earlier in the day for you. Um, not to say that I don't mind working at nine. It's just, uh, it's a little strange. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're you're more at the calm end of your day, so exactly. It's a different energy. It is. It is. And you know, maybe maybe it's even like the type of energy that helps with conversation too, because I'm like I'm chill, you know. Yeah, yeah. You're a little bit more laid back. Yeah, probably yeah. so. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. Yes. Although you see, you seem pretty laid back too. You seem like you're chilling. Your day's starting. You're in your studio. <laughs> That's a good uh, description. I'm kind of always in this phase of just trying to relax and enjoy each moment. So you know, it's kind of always evening in my mind. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't always work well out in the world, but you know, inside, I'm a happy camper. <laughs> I like that. I think maybe yeah. that's like something with us with us artists where we're just like mentally evening and then we live in a daytime world <laughs> where everyone's just no, hustling <laughs> i think so yeah i mean we're in our studios so much by ourselves in our in our minds so much of the time that that just becomes our reality absolutely oh my god yes well i think it is time where i ask you to please tell us a little bit about you and what you do Ah, yes. Well, I, uh, I'm a representational realist painter. I do a lot of figurative work, some landscapes. I'm an instructor at the Los Angeles Academy of Figurative Art right now. Um, I mostly do gallery and museum shows, so I spend the vast majority of my time in my studio painting, which I love. I feel extremely fortunate to be able to do that. And, and yeah, I mean, it's just... A dream come true, really. So I'm, um, you know, I'm happy to, I'm happy it's worked out thus far. <laughs> Hopefully, it stays this way. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's nice. It's not just nice. It's wonderful when a figurative artist can actually like enjoy and live from their work without any pressure. Because right. you're specifically like with figurative painting, it's one of the hardest uh, painting niches to be in. So yes, I agree. I agree. Kudos. Well, and not why that there's no pressure. I do feel like there's a tremendous amount of pressure, mm. but I try not to let that bring me down too much. I try not to think about it. You know, I just try to do the best work that I can. But what is inspiring is seeing painters like you and so many who have gone through sort of this academic system. And then you've mm. gone out on your own. You've studied with Odd Nerdrum, which is super cool. So mm. it kind of helps. Yeah, it, it you know keeps us all afloat it's it's inspiring to see and uh it's a good thing yeah yeah and similarly you know your work is very inspiring because again like figurative work not the easiest and also you are also you have a very interesting background which is that you originally started with graffiti and then tattooing and then yeah. 
figurative. And to top it off, um, from what I know, there aren't too very many ateliers in your area. So right. the fact that you even got into figurative painting without really being aware of the atelier movement is impressive. It's like, I would have thought you'd studied at an atelier. So <laughs> Right. No, that's, that's pretty cool to hear. I, I take that as a compliment. And that's true. There are a lot of academic schools. I'm on the West Coast. I'm in Santa Barbara, California. And no, it is very uncommon, actually. And as far as tattooing, that was a fascinating journey. Um, you don't meet a lot of tattoo artists who become, you know, fine artists or realist figurative painters. There, a lot of tattoo artists paint, but they do, you know, more tattoo style type of art. So yeah, how it worked for me was, you know, I was a kid who grew up skateboarding. And so you know, that just sort of, we all were into graffiti, you know, I, there were, I had friends who were in a crew and they, you know, it was just sort of what we did as kids. I didn't think anything about it. I just liked drawing and, and then they started to get into tattooing and I never thought about that. Like I was somebody who loved art, like I'm sure you are, like most artists, you know, we grow up, it's just seems to be part of who we are. Mm -hmm. And so I remember I was about 18 years old and I was working at a fitness center and I would sit at a desk all day. So I started bringing in a sketchbook and, and drawing and I eventually brought in canvases when I was actually painting at the desk and somebody came in and they were like, hey, have you ever thought about tattooing, you know? And I was like, no, uh, it just it just didn't seem like a, a real job or, you know, it was so foreign to me actually doing that as a profession. But then they were like, you know, there's a shop in town they're looking for an artist, you should look into being a, an apprentice. And so I was like, okay. And I went in there and I talked to the shop owner and he hired me right away. And he was like, your apprenticeship's going to be six months to one year. And at the time I, I didn't really, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. So I was like, <laughs> why not? <laughs> sure. Let's see. Let's see what happens, you know? Um, and it was super eye opening. It was like a whole new world but I loved it because it was doing art. I was drawing and um, designing tattoos. And then once, once I learned how to tattoo, I was just so hooked on it. I was obsessed with it. I loved it. And so I did that for four or five years. And I started to meet other tattoo artists who went to art school. You know, there are some tattoo artists. Yeah. They actually studied at, um, at an art school. So they had a background in it and they, they were telling me about this whole art world galleries, museums, the whole thing. And I was like, Oh, that's, that's interesting. How do you get into that? And they were like, Oh, you could, you know, study with this person and this person. And so I, I started to take workshops, you know, did the whole workshop route. And in one of these workshops, I saw a painting by Jeremy Lipkin. And that's when I was like, Holy shit, that's what I want to do. That is it. And then I found out that he painted it from life. It was like one of his outdoor nudes, you know, like a very Zorn-esque outdoor mm -hmm. nude. And, and lo and behold, he actually lived about an hour and a half away from me. And he was doing a workshop like a month later. So I signed up and I went there. And that's kind of what kickstarted the whole thing. My whole interest in figurative fine art and that became the obsession, which still rages on to this day, of course. Um, wow. Yeah, it, it was pretty cool. And when I met Jeremy, we we had a lot of similarities. Like we became friends. I worked as his assistant for a couple workshops and um, and and learned under him. And it, and it was through that process that I realized that my fundamentals weren't as strong as I wish they were. So that's when I went to the LA Academy of Figurative Art, where I now teach. And I got some like foundational classes there. So it was, it was a journey to get to this point, but a fun Dude. one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I was actually going to say, this is very much like hero's journey. Like I wouldn't <laughs> be surprised if that guy that walked in and saw you like sketching, if he was like some wizard <laughs> 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 sent by God knows what to like put you on your path. You know, it's, it's crazy because it's like, you know, the longer we live, the longer we we can experience moments like that, where our path, you know, in hindsight, it's so obvious. But in that moment, it's like, oh, where is this leading me? You know, and it usually is like your intuition and like your calling 
that is like right there. And we don't see it right. in the moment. Oh, that's a, that's well put. I totally agree with you. It, it Things are just happening in that moment. You're just sort of living, making decisions. It's only in hindsight that I now realize because it feels so like painting, doing what I, it feels so real, feels so true. It feels so unavoidable. Like it had to happen one way or another. And that, you know, those are the events that played out. It made it happen. And, but uh, yeah, no, I think you're onto something there. <laughs> I mean, I think I just, you know, I talk to so many artists, you know, like you who are, sometimes they just it's almost like you get thrown onto the path it, 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 like you don't choose it it chooses you it's so spooky <laughs> yeah you're right I know I never used to think like that but I think that there might be something to it yeah yeah um and like the f the other really cool thing that I also see with um with paths like ours is that we don't resist right we just like go with the flow we're like okay very much yeah so. I'm going to go check this out and see where this takes me. Cause that's literally how I ended up on the podcast too. So <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's very much well, like, Oh, okay. I mean, it sounds like <laughs> from your story, it was very much a part of who you were, but you knew that at a young age, which is, which is pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. I feel like most people, it takes a while for, for that to click. But I mean, how did you know, like when you were in high school that you, you were, you know, interested in this stuff? Oh man. I guess long story short, um, you know, I I met someone who went to an atelier school and then I became really obsessed with, you know, that these schools even existed because I thought, oh, you, no one can learn to paint like that anymore. That's like, that's like in the past, I wish, but like that's in the past. Um, and then I studied art history and I completely fell in love with the old masters. I got really bored once we hit, you know, like after the war and like. <laughs> Yeah, really bored. I could not. It was AP art history also. So like I got a four, but mostly because like the majority of the questions were like, oh, who's this thing by? And it's like a modern sculpture. And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was the only weirdo in my class using oil paints. <laughs> Everyone else was like playing with acrylics. And I was like, no, I want to try oils because that's what the old masters used. Ah, yes, you just gravitated towards it. I know it was like acrylics and all sorts of modern new mediums and all this mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I was not into that. It, it I, I don't know. It just, it's like I was saying, it's like a calling. It's like something, like a, like a little thread that's like pulling you or something. And you have to be so right. careful to not break it and like you just follow it, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah I just it's hope it's not leading me to the Minotaur. <laughs> <laughs> fingers crossed hopefully not fingers crossed yeah I mean if I do meet it that's cool I think I can handle it but you know yeah fingers <laughs> crossed anyway prepared. yeah yes. gotta be prepared you know isn't it um speak softly and carry a big stick or something <laughs> that sounds about right <laughs> yeah yeah oh man but to continue also um I actually do have a lot of friends that I met at Angel Academy who are tattoo artists really oh that's pretty yes. cool yeah, there's more and more of an influx of tattoo artists who are becoming, um, well, or not becoming, but they're attending ateliers. Right. Um, or even artists who go to ateliers and then become tattoo artists, which is also fascinating. Right. <laughs> yeah, it is. I think, well, I, like one major plus about tattooing, it's one of the art forms where you can actually make like a pretty good living. It's not like painting, you know, painting is so, there's so much luck and timing involved and it takes so long to be able to sell your work, you know, for enough to make it work. But it's, but it's a tattoo artist, like on average, you know, you charge like $200 an hour at most shops. So, you know, it's, it's a good living. That, I mean, for me, that was tricky to leave that sort of security. Mm -hmm. But, um, but anyway, how I think that that's why it's, and that, you know, the um, standards are getting so high now that, to be trained, you know, you're at a more competitive level, you know, you're going to be a better tattoo artist. So it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, the last note on that is uh, also on social media, there are a lot of in freaking credible tattoo artists. Um, and of For course, sure. when I check their rates, because I'm like, Ooh, that would be cool. Uh, oof, I cannot afford it. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's expensive, right? I, mm -hmm. I would have that conversation. One of my teachers at LAFA was Sergio Sanchez. 
he, mm. brilliant painter, great painter, but a really great tattoo artist. And now he tattoos full time. And he would be like, yeah, you know, people, sometimes they won't bat an eye and they'll drop two grand, three grand on a tattoo, but never in a million years would they buy a painting for that. You know, they, they don't want to hang something on their wall like that, but when it's on their body, they view it differently. So it's, it's an interesting way that, you know, that people think. So, uh, yeah. 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 I think what, what makes it different though, if, if you really think about it is I don't think I've ever really met someone who just like gets a tattoo on a whim, unless it's from like a really cheap studio usually. Right. And from my personal experience getting tattoos, I think for months, <laughs> Like, I will have the idea even for years and then I'll find the right person and then I'll be like, OK, I'm doing this. Yeah. So it takes it's almost like like maybe like a, I would equate it to like a commission, you know, like when someone commissions right. a painting from you. So I guess that yeah. would be a little bit of a difference, you know. Right. That's true. No, that's a yeah. good. Um, it's good to clarify that because, yeah, I mean, for you, like, you know, you're a little bit more art savvy, probably. But that's kind of how it should be viewed. It's like you're you are investing in a work of art on your body for the rest of your life. Yeah, it should, you know, a decent amount of thought is useful in making those decisions. Yes. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, if you're, you're like, gonna disappoint your parents, you might as well make it pretty. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. I remember when I got the first like major tattoo, my arm. Mm -hmm. um it was very much like by like I just wanted a, a work of art from that artist I almost didn't even care what it was it was just I wanted his work kind of like how I look at like a lot of painters now it's like I love what they do it almost doesn't matter if it's a figure painting a portrait a still life whatever it's kind of how they paint that I connect with so anyways similar similar thing no yeah I've, I've also seen that where I I do have friends who've gotten tattoos um but specifically, like, they just went to the artist and they're like, I want you to do something here. And that's it. Like, I, it, it has to be your style. And that is, you know, another really cool aspect about tattooing and, and how it crosses over in that way with painting. It's really Definitely. cool. Yeah. yeah, it is. And then also, it's really interesting to me, too, is, you know, you, you mentioned that jumping over from the security of tattooing to, you know, starting over basically like laying down mm. that foundation for painting what was that like for you well I remember I had a bit of a strategy at the time so I was tattooing for yeah a little over five years I had saved up some money and my grandpa had passed away and he he left me some stock actually it wasn't like that much but it was enough where I was like I'm going to take this sort of leap of faith and so I found a studio um it, so it was a commercial yeah, I found this commercial space right like this big commercial space um that was reasonably priced and I was thinking if I could uh turn this into a live work studio and I was dating this girl at the time I was like if you live with me like I could afford to do this and I could go I could paint and I won't have to worry about making money for like a few months you know mm. so that's what I did I I cashed in like everything that I had and got this studio and it was a little risque because it was a commercial building, but I wasn't supposed to be living in it, you know, mm -hmm. and rented, it was three rooms. I rented out one of the rooms to two other people. So I had like a 1500 square foot studio where I was paying myself about $800 a month for it in, in Santa Barbara, California, which is like insane, you know, a yeah. studio like that costs about 3000 a month. So, um, you know, I found a, found a way to make it work within, you know, the, my reality you know what, like what I had to work with and so that's how I did it at first and I was showing with a gallery in LA and they sold some paintings like right away I remember it gave me a, a nice boost of confidence but then <laughs> didn't oh. last so yeah I went through a period where they did they gave me a show I didn't I think I sold like one painting or something like that it was a bit yeah. of a bit of a bomb but um but, you know, I, I figured it out and started to kind of work my way into some level of consistency. But at first, yeah, it was I just tried to strategize as best I could and, and then just kind of went for it. And um, and luckily, you know, you know, the roof didn't cave in like I didn't lose my lease. All went OK. It worked yeah. out all right. Oh, I think it went better than all right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got Which I got I, pretty lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got lucky, but <clears throat> excuse me. See, now I'm the one with throat problems. 
<laughs> you got but, lucky, but I think you were you were very strategic, which helped a lot. Um, so kudos. I think that was thank brilliant. You. Yes. Yes. It's, it's I was naive and, and arrogant and lucky. But yes, yeah, some strategy too. <laughs> hey man you know to get away with certain things you got to be a little arrogant you know you gotta you gotta believe in yourself to a ridiculous extent because um you know sometimes when when we do risky things like that we are most of the time our own cheerleader yeah yeah, yeah. for sure yeah because usually our family is like are you crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know it's hard oh. to support such decisions yeah. but yeah, because it, it feels irresponsible, especially, you know, when we have this trope of like the starving artist, which clearly you're not starving. So <laughs> you say I'm, I'm overweight. Is that uh, what you're implying? <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're Just... doing great. <laughs> you have a roof over your head. You have a <laughs> studio. Um, You're not fat. <laughs> <laughs> For our listeners, he is not fat. You can watch the video. I promise. Thanks for clarifying <laughs> that. I'm wearing a lot of layers. All right. Don't hold it against me. Well, I mean, also, if you do bodybuild, though, you need to eat more calories. And that's expensive. That's true. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's expensive to build muscle big time. Yeah. Holy crap. <laughs> it's so expensive. <laughs> mm. And then also, like, paying for the gym, that's freaking expensive, too. Um, yes. 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 Got to account for that. Oh, yeah. Um. Anyway, <laughs> so one of the things that I'm I'm recently curious about in every person that I you know interview it is that uh, that transitional phase from student to living artist. Um, so I was curious how how did you manage that? How did you work through that transition? Mm, that. That's the hard part. When I teach classes now, I always try to caution students against that. Like it's going to be a bit of a rocky road. I remember when I, um, so I was I was doing these classes with with Jeremy Lipking once a week, and then I went to the to take classes at the LA Academy of Figurative Art. Just like I was saying, I needed stronger uh, fundamentals. And there, those teachers were like, okay, you're you're in for a ride. Like, it's going to be 10 years where it's going to be really hard. And then if you do sort of succeed, you're not, it's going to be really hard to actually be like rich. You'll never be rich. You know, it's not about the money, but I was always okay with that. Like, I was just like, as long as, as long as I can make ends meet and just keep paying and just keep doing what I'm doing, keep getting better, then it was all okay. So I kind of always had my focus pointed in that direction, not really caring about much else and I think that that was helpful again I I heard Daniel Sprick say this one time that it is it's like being naive and arrogant you know at a young age because you know like I'm a little bit older now I'm not sure if, if I would make those same decisions you know just knowing the realities of the world like it seems so risky to do that and you can get yourself into a real bind so uh anyhow I, I feel kind of grateful that I wasn't taking all that into consideration Mm -hmm. but mostly the transition what I think at the heart of all of it it's the work how good the work is or how personal it is people connect with it if that's working that things tend to take care of themselves I think um, to a large degree I mean there's still like a networking aspect to it and um, I found some some galleries that I really respected and tried to build relationships with them and I did. It took a while before they took me on for, you know, representation and all of that. Um, because I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of the gallery system. I know not everybody is, but it's worked pretty well for me. And uh, so, you know, just sort of being like a professional, you know, you, you establish good relationships with people in the business, in the industry, and they will want to help you. And then you work together. And before you know it, you have a happy career. So, you know, getting out there and doing that sort of a thing which I know for a lot of students, a lot of artists, you know, there's a lot of introverts out there. Uh, I could totally understand that. Spend a lot of time in the studio alone, getting out there and going to dinners and events and openings and meeting people and talking with people. It's not the most natural, but boy, does it help. I got to say, like the the results that I have gotten from doing that stuff, it's, I, I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be able to do all of this without it. So very helpful. Very good to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I feel like a lot of artists, um, 
they uh they don't realize that you know to succeed in this career you have to do the job of like 10 people <laughs> yeah you're totally yeah. right 100 sure. percent. yeah you're, oh it's, it can be so crazy because it's like you have to be your own uh bookkeeper your own administrator your own work manager photographer uh editor <laughs> yeah and then of course you have to be able to talk to people and that's like you said, you know, a lot of us are introverts and it, it can be so challenging to build relationships um, unless, you know, it does happen sometimes where like some unicorn artist has like a work that somehow, you know, just reaches certain people and they don't say a single word and they don't have yeah. an Instagram, they don't have anything and they're fine, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like game. a unicorn. Yeah. Right, yeah. yes. Yeah. It's like, I wish. <laughs> I don't know, me but, too. Yeah. But you know, for for everyone else, it's very common that we do have to take risks. And uh I also agree. I think it's great to take those risks when you're not aware of <laughs> how risky they are. Well, I'm sure that's familiar territory for you as well, because you came out of the academic system and then now you're hosting a podcast. You know, that doesn't just happen to you. You must have made certain decisions to make this all happen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, it is a little bit of networking as well, mm -hmm. you know, like how it happened to you. Um, actually, I would say a lot of the the best things in, in academic, in the academic world and in painting and in, in the art world is networking. I think it's uh, very underestimated for a lot of people how important it is. Um, and it's also, you know, that right place right time uh right preparedness and I, I that's what i think luck is is just being prepared at the right place at the right time and you talk to the right person you know yeah yeah definitely yeah so that's that's kind of how i landed on the podcast i just spoke to someone and uh that led to one thing and led to another and then here i am you know um and thankfully it it is what fuels my practice right now because i'm in that very complicated transitional stage of figuring out my stuff you know, like figuring out what I like and, and uh, how I want to represent myself through my work. And that's a very challenging phase, you know? Yes. Um, yeah, because it's like, it's the cocoon self-discovery phase where like, I, it's like, I really don't want to talk to anyone um, when I'm in my studio, right? When I'm in my studio, it's like, no, I'm figuring my shit out. And uh, that's another stage there are so many stages to, to being oh, an yeah. artist and it keeps changing these stages it they're is. always evolving yes yeah and and they like seamlessly like just go into the next which is really fascinating um and i know i didn't actually send you this question but how did you handle like how did you figure out you know like this this is what my thing is you know this is my voice how did you figure mm -hmm. that out well, I mean, to be honest, I'm still not sure that I feel like I figured that out. Um, mm. I'm not sure if I ever will. It's just, I try, I, I think about it all the time, as, as I'm sure we all do. Like, what what do I like? Why do I like it? Where are these ideas coming from? Um, how much of it is outside influence? You know, stuff that I see that I really like, and how much of it's, you know, emulation, how much of it's really like a true expression um and then the other like annoying voice in the back of my head is you know like who's going to connect with this like what audience is going to connect with this is it sellable will nobody care about it so uh it's like a constant battle um there usually are things that I know for sure I want to express in paint whether it's like an emotion like the um, like there, for, for example, there's a painting, like if anybody, if, if you're on my website, it's called Via Con Dios. It's this woman who's holding her hand out and this guy's walking away from her. And it's kind of like a Western-y piece. So just like as an example, okay, like I, that was, I was going through something with uh, somebody who I was really close with and we parted ways. And so I was like, like maybe I can put this in like a Western genre, like it, it almost like a filmmaker could make like a crime, a comedy, whatever. Mm -hmm. I was like, how could I tell a story? And I was like, oh, I'll try like sort of a Western genre. I went to this location where I had been plein air painting a bunch. It was really beautiful at sunset. 
And I was like, that that's going to amplify the mood if it has a sunset color scheme. And then I found models who had interesting looks and I brought them out there and kind of composed this whole scene where she's holding her hand out, she's walking away, you know, just sort of telling this story. But the root of it was just my own experience and then how to sort of convey it in an, an interesting visual way. Um, so, but that was just one painting. A lot of the time it's, it's, I'm just out somewhere and it's an inspiring landscape. And so I paint it simply for that reason. Uh, I have models come to my studio every Sunday. I do like a little group here where anybody can come paint. So I'll meet people that way. And a lot of times I'll, um, you know, like I'll see them, I'll be like, oh, I could see them as this character or as this, uh, this type of a painting with this color scheme wearing this outfit or whatever, or whatever. So I'll just start working out of that to get something. I think through all of these processes, they're all very much me and who I am. So I feel like they're honest expressions. And then I try and make it a good, a well-painted, nicely designed work of art. And my hope is that people will connect with that and that will kind of make it all work. But it still feels experimental um, every day. I mean, I paint every day, but I'm always looking for new and better ways to create something more interesting. And uh, I, yeah, I definitely don't feel like I've gotten there yet. You know, I look at a painting like Solomon J. Solomon's Samson. Are you? I'm mm. sure you're familiar with that. Oh, that painting's it's, amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. Like it, to me, it's like the epitome of what I want to create. It's like this dramatic, amazing multi-figure scene that is so well painted, so well composed. But yeah, and then I look at my work and I'm like, it's not even close. Like I've got to figure out how to make something that's going to impact people like that. And you know, it's a it's a process. Like like for Solomon J. Solomon, I mean, he was such a master and he did that painting. And then like Ajax and Cassandra is another one that I really love. Gorgeous. So it's like, you know, in his lifetime, that's like two masterpieces. I mean, he's done a lot of other amazing paintings, of course, but um but anyhow, so I'm striving for something like that. And I'm hoping through the process of striving for that, that it will, you know, it will always be genuine. You know, I'm not really trying to do anything other than other than that. And then, of course, always to get better technically and so on and so forth. But yes, that's, yes. that's my plan for that. I like that. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I'm on the same boat of like, you know, always. And this is something that I think every artist should be doing and that is always you should always be looking at the masters and it's it's very controversial too to be like to compare you know your work to like Rembrandt for example or compare your work to like God uh, da Vinci um it almost feels like today that's like illegal you know it's like no you can't do that <laughs> but we have to right because how else are we going to improve they did the same thing in their time they were looking at their old masters and like how do you do it i'm going to do that too you know um yeah. so yeah like that's that's a very good um so it's, it's a good way to keep you uh keep you working that's for sure now more than ever it's crucial to have a website when you're an artist especially if you want to be considered a professional in your career Thankfully, with our special link, faso.com forward slash podcast, you can make that come true and also get over 50% off your first year on your artist website. Yes, that's basically the price of 12 lattes in one year, which I think is a really great deal considering that you get sleek and beautiful website templates that are also mobile friendly, e-commerce, print on demand in certain countries, as well as access to our marketing center that has our brand new art marketing calendar. And the art marketing calendar is something that you won't get with our competitor. The art marketing calendar gives you day-by-day, step-by-step guides on what you should be doing today, right now, in order to get your artwork out there and seen by the right eyes so that you can make more sales this year. So if you want to change your life and actually meet your sales goal this year, then start by going to our special link, faso.com forward slash podcast. That's F-A-S-O dot com forward slash podcast. Bold Brush would also like to give a huge thank you and shout out to Chelsea Classical Studio for their continued support in this podcast. If you're interested in archival painting supplies that are handmade with a lot of patience, then go check out their Instagram at CCS Fine Art Materials. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it helps, I think it helps to keep standards high, you know, like you can mm -hmm. get lost in your own world of your own work and 
I've I've had that happen where like I'll be pretty happy with a painting that I do and then it won't be till like maybe a year later I see it next to like a really great painting by an old master and I'm like okay there are some clear differences here what are they uh you know I mean I try not to be too hard on myself but there also needs to be a level of being realistic like that and you don't want to you know compare yourself but I feel like you can compare your experience of what you see in a in a painting so that's kind of what I'm what I'm aiming for and yeah I I would imagine it's a healthy thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very healthy. Um, and then also it is, it's, it's, it is like, you know, gently comparing yourself because I mean, like you said, you can't also be like <laughs> so cruel um, because it's also worth it to remember that these people didn't have to go to school. They literally just straight from like childhood, they went into ateliers. They went into like actual, like, um, places where they were trained to do what they know best so they had all of their formative years and like like they by the age of like 20 they were already masters basically because that's all they were doing they didn't have to worry about calculus or <laughs> you know they weren't worrying <laughs> yeah, about good, any of that good, uh, that's a good distinction to make it's easy to forget that yeah and that's well, like although, the uh, you mm -hmm. you kind of do fall into that category. You started at such a young age and got into oh. it. So, you know, <laughs> no, you're a leg ahead I've, of us all. Oh, no, but the masters are still way ahead, way, way ahead. I mean, <laughs> whew, I mean, Da Vinci started sketching like a, there's a legend really. He apparently like made this drawing of a cat that was so realistic. It scared his own father. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't remember where I heard that, but that's one of the reasons why they also like put him uh to study with uh god i forget the name of his master right now it's, i'm blanking but he did start studying at a ridiculously young age um to sketch and to draw and to paint and to do all of these things um i don't i think by age 12 he was already like set he was like yep this yeah is it. He's already a <laughs> master at 12 oh. yeah it's, not, it's unfair i wish it was still like that you know where yeah. it, like art was appreciated at that level but Mm -hmm. eh, such is life i know the guy who runs the um art department at the school i teach at at lafa his name is leon okun he went to the repin academy are you familiar mm. with what they have going on there dude it's <laughs> yes. crazy yeah it's like jesus like it's like being becoming a doctor you know they still look mm -hmm. at it like that um yeah. and it's no wonder those, those russians are so good you know because they have yeah. that kind of a hundred percent. I mean, I, I thought about applying to their program at one point, but then it was like seven years and I'm like, yeah, I know it's shit. hard to justify <laughs> that. Like it used yeah. to be you'd come out of a seven year program and yeah, you would probably make what a doctor makes. I mean, not that it's like all about money or whatever, but if you're going to sacrifice that much of your life, you yeah. know, it's hard nowadays to come out into uh, you know, good luck, <laughs> good luck selling a painting, you know, good luck selling a painting on Instagram and maybe a gallery will represent you. You know, it'll take years or whatever, but yeah, it's tough business. It is, yeah, it is. Um and and I think in part, you know, in in the perspective of like sociology, it's also been like the craziest 30 years in humanity, you know, like you would think World War One and Two were like, oh yeah, this is this is the crit. No, <laughs> <laughs> this the the world of the internet has completely revolutionized everything. Um, and I think it's also caused like a disenchantment in the like in only seeing like abstract and like all of these like art forms that took over after World War Two. Yeah. Now we're like in a, a bit of a revival, like a, a Renaissance 2.0, as Clint Watson likes to put it um of you know this revival of the appreciation for the figurative which it's interesting it's almost like a return to humanism which um right we'll see where that goes <laughs> yeah yeah it's nice to see that it's going in that direction what uh what did you know when you were at gca what is their feeling about all of that you know because it seems like they're really trying to prepare the next generation are they you know are they um hopeful optimistic about that I'm not 100% sure that that's something they really worry about um, because they have such a huge influx of students. They get so many applications a year that I don't think they worry too much about um, not getting students or because like <clears throat> with all of these academic schools, actually, it's um, 
it's become a priority to simply pass it on mm. and uh it's become like exponential right so like there are students who who like for example like shane wolf he studied at, at angel academy and then he started a school in paris um I'm not sure if it survived the pandemic, but <laughs> there are a lot of students who have gone to these early, early academies and they've started their own schools. And uh, and then there are more schools popping up and more schools popping up. So I think it's not necessarily something they worry about because it feels like it's being taken care of on its own, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah definitely. Even if some people like fall through the cracks, you know, and, and maybe they they quit painting after going to one of these ateliers, there's still like five or like 10 percent who started their own schools or started taking on their own students. And that, you know, they disseminate all of that important stuff that we almost completely lost in the 20th century. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's cool. That's good to hear. I didn't realize. I didn't know that there was so much interest in going to that school. I mean, it makes sense. The training that you get there is is incredible. Um, it's uh, it's almost uh, it's it's a great method, right? You you learn what you need, but sometimes it can. I would even warn people that it could be like almost like a crutch. Because, oh, yeah, because once you finish school, um, I don't know if you've noticed that, you know, when someone goes to a specific school, they all paint the same. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's always the uh, that's always the critique about like GCA or those schools, you know, but yeah. Yeah. What, how do you I, I do have a feeling about that, but I would be curious to hear yours. What's your thought on that? Um. Well, in my opinion, you know, it's it's comfortable, like. Because I've I've felt this way the first few paintings I did after I graduated, um, I I was comfortable. It was like you know you have a formula, you have a thing that's that you know how, exactly how it's gonna be, and you do it, and you always get the same results, right? So, it's in my opinion, it's just a place of comfort, which is why I'm personally like going through a phase of unlearning, of experimenting, yeah. Like forcing myself to like step out of that, uh, challenge myself to use entirely different brushes or a, an entirely different palette or something because you can't grow if you're comfortable. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So what's your theory? <laughs> well, I always feel like um, it's better than the alternative, you know, to not have that that skill set. Um, and then when you see somebody who goes through that program and then does do their own thing, it's like absurd. Like Will St. John comes to mind, mm -hmm. you know, it's like he, you can tell he's academically trained, but he's really taken it to another place or he, Colleen Berry, like his wife, you know, same thing with her, you know, her work is so different, so unique, but it's so good. And with all those, the students who come out of there, if you can like transcend, the uh the sort of standards where everybody is at then it's like you're really doing something special so i think i feel like that's better than not doing it like if i could go back i would definitely go to a school like that and uh yeah i'll be on the west coast there's really there's lafa which has like an element of that academic training but out here on the west coast there's like impressionism is just like rampant you know there's a lot of impressionist painters out here which is cool like i like that too um but uh, you miss a lot of the um, what I would consider to be pretty important knowledge, you know, anatomy, of course, um, form rendering, all that kind of stuff. So I guess there's no like perfect solution to it. But I would say it seems like that's the best option available today. But then you really do have to work hard internally to work out of that. So it's interesting to hear that you're struggling with that. Or I mean, not that you're struggling with it, but you're working on it. You're going through yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, it, it can feel like a struggle sometimes. Um, yeah. And I, I do agree. It is it is, a, it, it is better to have a good foundation than to start completely blind. Um, yeah. Especially if your goal is something like Solomon J. Solomon, right? Um, who was, of course, academically trained and uh, freaking amazing and even wrote a book uh, in case you're ever interested in reading it. He wrote cool. a book on oil painting so <laughs> i have no bad book. <laughs> oh it's a great book um yeah. oh 
it's worth a reread. Um, but I know I read through it once and I, I was like, I need to reread this again. I don't, I'm not sure I'm comprehending all of it. Cause yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it's like a class in the book, which can be hard yes. to uh, ingest, but anyhow, still very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then also it's like, you have to read it and then put it into practice as well and then reread it to see if you missed anything. Cause it's like, right. this is, I mean, it's a thick book first of all, but also like the, I feel like it's like an iceberg. <laughs> we're like the book is this big but the knowledge you get is like oh yeah deeper. yeah true yeah it is deceiving yeah. right it's like a small little book there's not a lot of there's no color reproductions in it or anything mm -hmm. almost the opposite of um Richard Schmidt's book which those yeah. two are probably my favorites I love a la prima too that was that's an inspiring book to read I'm sure you enjoyed it as much as I did yes yeah I did I think I I think I might have read that one twice also because it's um I, that's one of the things that I first did once I got out of academic school was Alla Prima because oh. you don't really get that you don't really get that in uh, academic school you mostly um, like specifically at like GCA well actually at Angel Academy too it's it's a lot of long-term painting like you, you're working on the same painting for a month sometimes and wow. that can be um, in my opinion it's detrimental I feel like if you can paint a lot do it because by the time you reach the end of your painting and you're going to start the next one uh you already forgot what you needed to learn if that makes <laughs> yeah. sense yeah yeah <laughs> like, that does it's like, I, I think it was Richard Schmidt who said more starts are more valuable than like a long painting you know if you do 10 starts rather than like a 10 hour painting or whatever you know mm -hmm. um, makes sense so that was yeah that was my inspiration um to challenge myself to do Alla Prima because uh it's uh, not something you learn in academic school. At academic school, it's very long term. Okay, you do this section and you do this section. It's very like slow. Um, Interesting. Yeah, but I, I, I think I retain information better when I'm forced, at least like Richard Smith, to like do it and do it and do it and do it because um, it's like I don't know what can I even compare it to. It's almost like. Like if you were going to the gym like once a week versus going to the gym every day and training different parts of your body, right? That's what I would compare it to. You get more results than if you just train once a week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good analogy. And it does make a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can't, you can't get six pack apps if you're just hitting the gym once a week. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. I wish. Yeah. Yes. If only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. But Yeah. Yeah, and then I'm sure that you also, from my experience with like finding GCA, I'm sure you also found a lot of these schools through social media, right? Yeah. Like thanks to social media. I mean, I remember I was at Angel Academy and then I heard about GCA when I was at Angel Academy through social media because I was like, how do they do it? <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like this is amazing. <laughs> so true. That's my experience yeah. entirely. Yeah. Um, but aside from, you know, finding these amazing schools, I think it's also, you know, social media has become such a great tool uh, for mm -hmm. us artists to find collectors and to find fans of our work. Um, so I wanted to know, um, how do you use social media to collect with, co to, to collect, listen to me, how do you use social media? <laughs> <laughs> I think I can sort of feel the time. <laughs> how do you social media collect social? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> How do you use social media to find collectors? <laughs> well, I love uh, social media for that reason. You know, there's a lot of negatives to it, of course. But uh, yeah, if you manage it well, it's just like anything, you know. It's just, it's, you know, if you handle it responsibly, it can be an amazing thing. I have connected with many collectors through Instagram. I started to do, I do a studio sale once a year now that's only on Instagram that does, you know, great. Um there have been, I, I, it's hard to keep track. Like there have been so many shows where it's been with a gallery, but the per, the collector who bought the painting found it through my own Instagram account. So I remember at first it was like, you know, are these collectors? Cause you know, a lot of them are a little bit older, so they're not going to be like super social media savvy, mm -hmm. but lo and behold, I found a lot of them were creating Instagram accounts uh, just for that reason, you know, to follow artists whose work they liked and, so they started to reach out and yeah, I, I communicate with them all the time. You know, 
Um, maybe every week somebody messages about some pain, you know, where it's going, how much it is, whatever it may be. So it's really nice to have that um, that connection and have it be so easy, so direct. Um, I sell s through Instagram a little bit. I still, like, I got to tell you, like, I kind of prefer the gallery world for that. You know, I just love to be in the studio painting. I don't really want to worry about much else if I can help it. So every once in a while, I'll do the Instagram selling thing. But most of the time, I, I do prefer if I can just paint and then and then send it out, you know, and have uh, the gallery handle that. Mm -hmm. But and then, but marketing and all that kind of stuff, connecting with other artists, it's really helpful. Um, when, you know, Instagram, I can just link it right up to my website. So a lot of people will maybe find me on Instagram and then go to my website and they wouldn't have found my website otherwise. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty helpful. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I love it. I mean, I just try not to spend too much time on it, I guess, but I find it to be very useful for that. And then also very inspiring for looking at other work, what other people are doing. Um, yeah, it's a good thing in my world. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, it's great that now there are collectors who are making Instagrams who are older <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, because, um, it's so it's so fascinating because like you know there's like i feel like there's like this separation right there's like the older art collectors who they mostly work through galleries and then there's like the younger collectors who work with instagram right to find artists but i like that now it's mixing <laughs> yes me too there I, is hope. yeah most definitely Yes. I remember I did a little like plein air painting of this rose garden out here by the mission, you know, the, these California missions. And, you know, this older person, this older couple saw the painting and they were like, oh, we got married there. We we want to buy it. And, you know, they, they had never used social media before. They got on it to follow a few of their favorite painters and happened to see that painting of mine. And it was a piece that I was just doing for fun. And mm -hmm. now they're, you know, it's their collector of my work now. So that was such a great example of how that worked and um yeah wouldn't have happened otherwise interesting interesting do you ever sometimes feel this is like a little bit out of like the just from hearing that do you ever feel like sometimes you make a painting for someone without knowing you made a painting for someone that is an buy it <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure if i've ever thought about it that way mm. um but i like how you phrase that there's there's that's fascinating um yeah, there's definitely there have definitely been some cases where people have connected with a piece and it's super personal to them. Or there, oh, this was an interesting recent little tidbit. I did this painting of a girl sitting on some rocks, looking at some fog coming in over the mountains, and this woman saw it in the gallery, and the gallery owner said it brought tears to her eyes. She said she was living in New York five years previous to this, had a dream about that very same scene. She was in the dream. She actually wrote me this whole like paragraph description about how much she connected with it. So in that case, yeah, I was, I feel like I was just a conduit of, you know, conveying this, this piece that was personal to her. And that was, that was pretty interesting, you know, and I've had that happen, not, not, maybe not that deep, but similar stories like that have happened before. So um, yeah, again, there could be something to that. There's some sort of, uh, some sort of connection there. Fascinating. It's also yeah. really trippy. I mean, if I dreamt about something and I saw it in a painting, I'd be like, <laughs> "Yeah, yeah." <laughs> I, I know it, it. always. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's it's interesting how that works. Yeah. Oh my god. Now I kind of want to go into like Carl Jung and like the the, the collective unconscious, but <laughs> I mean, I know you can go down a deep, long rabbit hole when you start thinking about that sort of a thing. Yes. Because yeah, it is fascinating. I, yeah, I usually don't go down the rabbit hole, but I consider it. Maybe I will one day. Yeah. Getting into yeah. Yeah, Freud, all that fun stuff. Yeah. I mean, the the conversation I had with Clint and uh, Christopher Remmers uh, last week was pretty trippy. And oof, because we talked about entropy. <laughs> oh, interesting. I'm going to have to listen yeah. to this one. Oh, that one's, it's going to be so good. I mean, by the time that this episode is out, that episode is already out. So if you guys haven't heard the Christopher Remmers and, and Entropy episode, that freaking, I had so much fun. Had yeah, so that's fun. awesome. Yeah, I love definitely it. a rabbit hole. Very cool. Very cool. Nothing like a good rabbit hole. Oh, 
it it really takes it to another level because like just you know really quick it's like there's like in order for us to create and to make beautiful work you know you, we have to feel some sort of inspiration right um not always but i feel like or we came to the conclusion that the best work usually is inspired work hmm. and usually it is work that has a, a percentage that has opened itself to chaos which is so fast yeah <laughs> yeah it is fast yes oh that's just like the tip of the iceberg of the actual whole conversation um and then also applying it to social media and how like you know social media is also like chaotic but oh no hey ooh. yeah how do you feel about <laughs> social media in in that context are you a fan do you like it or do you think it's um, good i think you know and i've said this before uh it's a double-edged sword it's useful and I think I have sold the majority of my work actually through Instagram, which is really great. In terms of, um, you know, like using it as a tool, I think it's a great tool to use. But in terms of it being uh, a hole full of nightmares, it can be. <laughs> can be. Yeah. But I guess yeah. anything could. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you let it take over your life. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it can be very distracting very distracting and and like you said actually earlier uh you had mentioned how much of my work is just because i saw it right just because i saw someone else do that thing and i thought it was cool um it's like you have to put away those things and that can be really challenging when you have social media in front of you yeah that's a good, yeah for sure no it, that could be tricky yeah, yeah yeah that's that's super distracting or yeah, you'll you'll see some cool like landscape and maybe you're working on a figurative painting and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I got to do something like that because I'm so inspired by it. And yeah, no, there's there's a lot of distractions that come along with it. Mm -hmm. How about your website? Do you keep that up to date then? Is that where you post most of what you're up to? Actually, I haven't, I haven't updated it too much, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Totally. I'm on the same page. I think every, like it's just that studio time. Working on your work, yeah. that's the focus. That's what's most important. All the other stuff is you have to do it, but it takes a backseat. Yeah. Yes. And this is actually a really great segue to my next question, which is how do you handle the administrative side <laughs> to <laughs> be an artist? Out. Yeah, I uh, I hate that side of it, as I think everybody does. Right? Like, I always think if I had you know like enough money I would hire somebody to do all of that for me maybe someday anyhow um I have built a bit of like a routine with my day so that I because it would be I think it'd be impossible if I was just like I, I'll take care of it here and there or whenever so I structure it as like I kind of live like every day the same for the most part uh, very routine which is nice so I allot two hours in the morning every day like I'll like I have breakfast and I'll read art books and all that kind of stuff and then I'll sit down and I'll go through all emails, uh, correspondence with galleries, shows, whatever, uh, cataloging images, you know, website updates, whatever. But just two hours every day, and then after that is when I you know paint or do everything else. So it's not even on my mind. I don't think about it at all anymore. I just try to get it out of the way, get it done, and then onto what I really want to do and that does seem to work pretty well um yeah and I it's mean, efficient. exactly it, it it's very efficient um and personally this I resonate with this because I also started making a routine like a daily routine to get my stuff done because I unfortunately uh have ADHD so <laughs> if I get in a painting I will hyper focus forget to eat uh forget that I actually had to turn something in, I don't know, like maybe like finish editing a podcast or send, you know, interview questions or something. Um, so <laughs> I I need a routine. So I, I think I might I might do that too or have where I, I'll a lot, like a little extra time to my website yeah, because yeah. I haven't done that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. It's, it's so effective. I even find myself like I'll be painting, I'll be immersed in a painting. I'll be like, oh shoot, like it's eight o'clock, it's dinner time. I got to take a dinner break, you know? And I'll be, I remember hanging out with a friend one time and he was telling me about some exciting thing going on or some movie out. And I was like, oh yeah, I can't wait till like I get a day off and I can go do that. And 
He's like, like, what are you talking about? He's like a day off. He's like, you can do whatever you want every day. And I just forget, like, I have this schedule. I have these hours, you know, um, mm -hmm. I just stick to that because if I didn't, I'd be lost, you know? So I, I have to do that and makes it, makes it so, uh, so much easier. Yeah. And then, you know what, that, oh, that brings up a pet peeve of mine, uh, which I'm pretty sure a lot of artists can relate. And that is uh, your friends who are not artists think that you're literally doing nothing. <laughs> yes. God, you cannot say that again. That's so true. Oh, Everybody, friends, family, whatever. Like most people, like they're respectful of it, but yeah, they just don't really understand, you know. Um, I, I remember this funny story. I think it was uh, Julio Reyes, you know, his work. Mm -hmm. He was talking about how, so Julio, he's like this very successful artist, does amazing work, you know, he's he's gone pretty far and I guess he has a pretty successful family or maybe it's his wife's family. So when their family get togethers, they're all, they view Julio and his wife as like these bohemian artists who are just out there having fun. Like they're not as, you know, like important as the doctors in the family or whatever and that. And then, and then he'll go to like a conference where he's giving a speech and they will be so well respected. You know, he talks about sort of living in these two worlds where a lot of times, yeah, the general public, they don't really understand, you know, like how brilliant he is for example you know but then he goes to his you know his his group of people and he's highly esteemed and I mean not that like we need to be so highly esteemed or whatever but you know just some level of understanding there's a lot of uh preconceived notions a lot of misunderstandings and seems to be how it is yeah yeah it happens to me sometimes really someone will ask me like oh do you want to go do this now and I'm like my work time do yeah. it like Saturday <laughs> <laughs> when it's yeah, my day yeah. off like I'm off Saturday Sunday we can do Saturday <laughs> yeah totally just, just hanging I mean, out phone like... calls. <laughs> you probably get your friends calling you but like if you were at your at your if you were at work you probably wouldn't get called in the middle of the day you know they know oh she's at work you know so that happens a lot too I, you know I always feel like I was like God, I don't want to be such like an asshole but I gotta tell people like I'm I'm working my you know yeah, yeah so gotta pay the bills <laughs> gotta pay the bills yeah. can't pay the yeah. bills if you're telling me i'm you know let's go to the movies right so right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. that focus is is so crucial you know to it just is. Be, be a yes especially when you're like in a painting or like you're working in like a specific part of a painting and um you're worried about the drawing time and then also like the order of how you're gonna do something and then if you're thrown off of that like sometimes i come back to a painting and like Oh, I didn't do the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hate when that. Oh, it's the worst. It's the worst. Like at, at academic school, it was usually like, I forgot to fan brush my painting. Now I'm going to have some <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, Like when you had to join parts of a painting and like you didn't fan brush it. That would be a nightmare, huh? Oh, it was the worst. Yeah. Especially because, again, it was like such a slow process. It was like. <laughs> or like you'd get yeah, like the, the hard. It, yeah it's hard because like you get this like curse edge especially when it's like background and like the figure right sometimes if you know you you get like a bit of an edge of like leftover paint in between so you have right to, like, get rid of it before the next day or else you're gonna have a cursed edge and it's uh, never gonna go away no matter yeah, how yeah, many yeah. layers you put <laughs> i do hate seeing those types of edges in paintings you know I have a friend who takes a big piece of paper and he'll put it on the wet painting surface and press it all down if he's going to go back into it. Mm. Always found that fascinating. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's a technical aspect of painting. I like as much of a hassle as that is. I feel like if you can get that stuff right, that's when it's like it really sort of sings, you know. Mm -hmm. Like you look at a painting and like that's really well done and really well thought out, and I feel like it's a good game of chess that that person played you know they thought through every step and yeah yeah I always enjoy that um yeah 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 it does feel like a game of chess that's a really great analogy because you're yeah, it especially does, does when it? it's yeah especially when it's like a long term painting where you, it takes multiple sittings um right it definitely like and especially if you're going to be glazing oh you really have to plan shit out <laughs> do you have to strategize you got to make the right move so that five mm -hmm. days later you know you can make the next right move yep or else you're but set back I, like, 
Yes, yes. But when it's well done, boy, does it work well. Yes, I 100% agree. I hope people can can get some good technique stuff from the conversation as well. Yeah, that's true. That's probably the most interesting thing too, I got to say, at least for us, you know, to listen to a mm. podcast. I love hearing all the, the technical notes and everything like that. It's very cool. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, Because it's like every every artist has like a, it's almost like you find a solution, right? For something. And maybe someone's struggling with that exact same thing. Like, <gasps> yeah, yeah, oh my God. true, probably so. A lot of problem solving. I mean, that's like painting is just filled with problem solving. A lot of people they'll ask me if my work's uh, like indirect, you know, like layered and everything. Mm -hmm. I'm very much an alaprima, wet into wet type of a painter. Interesting. Who works section to section, and I do have to strategize about how to, you know, not have all these hard edges mm -hmm. or dried layers of paint. Um, it can be tricky. I've heard some tricks some painters do is they'll put paintings in their freezer so that they don't dry overnight mm -hmm. yeah that works pretty well yeah. Um, but yeah there's something to that freshness you know like there's some it's nice when a painting is fresh and feels more alive like that rather than like overworked and mm -hmm. there's there is a fine line for sure very fine line I agree um and you know it it also goes a little bit back into that inspiration part too where I feel like it's so easy to overwork a painting that's too planned out, you know? Mm. But when you let that little bit of chaos in and you just like don't perfectly plan it completely, but you you leave, you just leave a little bit of space of like playing around, it it can kind of like prevent you from overworking because yeah. you're forced to like, okay, this, this is going to work. Or like you suddenly get like, ah, I found the solution for this one space that I intentionally left blank. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know. you're right. No, that's, that's important. I, I do have a little bit of a strategy for that as well. Like earlier in the day, I paint, um, I'm like a little bit sharper, you know, uh, earlier mm -hmm. in the day, not tired. And then, so I'll work on stuff that requires that level of focus at that time of the day. And then I'll enjoy a beverage or two. And then I'll paint in the evenings. And I will, it's like a completely different mentality. It's like a whole okay. different consciousness. And uh, I'll be way less careful. And sometimes I'll make mistakes and I will be upset with myself. But sometimes good things come of it. So it's kind of cool to like play around with that a little bit, you know, to not always paint when you're at the same mental capacity. You know, it's nice to have a variety in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's a way of letting that chaos in. It's pretty cool. I, yes, I think so. <laughs> I, nice to let the chaos. You, yeah, you want the yin and yang, right? You want the balance. You want a little bit of chaos, a little bit of order. If you can mm -hmm. get those two balanced, I think that's a good thing. Yes. And the painting will also appreciate it. It's like that's where it breathes, if that makes sense. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. That's where the life comes. Oh, beautiful. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, yes. Very beautiful. Um, so... Do you have any wisdom for young artists who are just getting out of school and maybe they want to start, you know, they want to find a way to make money from their work, um, but they're literally just out of school, which is probably a lot of our listeners as well. Do you have any words of wisdom for them? <laughs> I wish there was like a clear path to take, you know, that could get you to where you want to go. Yeah. Because I've seen... Um, you know, I've seen stories that are all over the place. Like I've seen people do it one way and them do it another. The way that I did it was networking with galleries and trying to do good work. But there is an inherent problem to that because most good gallery, like what I would consider to be a good gallery that has a good reputation, they show, they represent the same artists most, most of the time for their lifetime, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like they can represent 30 artists. So it's pretty rare that they're going to have room for somebody new. My words of wisdom are, are there are a tremendous amount of problems and I would advise against it. But if you, if you really want to, <laughs> well, like it, it's what it's, you can't stop it again. It's like you, you're so passionate about it. You're going to do it no matter what. So as far as something that's helpful, definitely, like we were saying, get out of your comfort zone, constantly challenge yourself. But I still, I still thoroughly believe at the heart of all of it, it's if the work is really well done, like if you studied, if you've worked hard, if you understand good design, composition, interesting subject matter, that 
most of the time I feel like will carry you through a lot of those hard times. And then all the other stuff, it's still important, but it's not as important as that. Um, yeah, of course, establishing an Instagram presence is helpful. Um, you know, having a good rapport with collectors is helpful. <laughs> Seems obvious, but it, I made some mistakes early on in my career where I, I can tell you a brief story. I did a commission for this gentleman, very nice guy very rich and I did he bought a bunch of my paintings and then he commissioned me to, to do a big piece for his living room and so I did the did the painting and he came to pick it up and his wife didn't like a number of things about it and wanted me to change it and bear in mind at the time I was in my early 20s okay I, nowadays I would I, at least I, I like to think I would handle the situation a little bit better than I did then mm -hmm. but um you know maybe I was a little like prideful or something um, and I was like, okay, I'll make all these changes. I mean, I wasn't happy about it, but I was like, I'll make them. I'm going to have to charge you, you know, X, Y, and Z in order to do it. And they didn't want to do that. They were like, we, you should have done this the first time around. You know, we kind of fought back and forth about it. Mm. I ended up getting a letter from their attorney that they were going to take me to court over the matter. Yes, that's always oh. a fun experience to go through. <laughs> oh, so, unexpected. Um, oh, Yeah. Yeah, I didn't see that one coming either from him. But then I came to find out he was a very uh, litigious fellow who had done this a number of times to other people. And um, it was very much a power sort of a situation, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not even sure if it was about anything other than that. So I talked to a lawyer and he was like, uh, you know, how much money does this guy have? And I was like, yeah, he's a multimillionaire. And he was also, he's also pretty well known, has a lot of like celebrity friends. And I did a painting for this musician that he set up for me, he, you know, anyhow, influential individual. And he was like, well, how much money you know, do you have to go up against him? And I was like, I might have a couple hundred dollars in my account right now. I don't know. Oof. And uh, yeah, so he's like, yeah, just, just do the, you know, fix the painting, make the changes. And, um, and so I did, but it did sort of ruin that relationship with him. And then he, again, he was very well connected, had a lot of friends and he had hooked me up with a lot of paintings before that. And it kind of mm -hmm. severed that relationship. So in hindsight, regardless of how I felt, you know, I should have swallowed my pride for sure. And, you know, that's just life. You, you have to deal with people like that sometimes, you know, not everybody's going to be fair, but, um, the solution there is. It's, yeah, to not let your emotions get the better of you, you know, to not, but to, yeah, I should have just handled it differently. And and I still would have had him as a collector. And um, like, I could live with that. You know, you need collectors in your life to support your work, mm -hmm. even if they are rude at times. But, um, you know, yeah, if you can avoid situations like that, which, you know, I, I have, that's not an entirely uncommon story. I have other friends who have experienced the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, even painters who are, you know, really well known, and they have collectors who act like that with them. And, uh, you know, you just have to sort of deal with it. So yeah. yeah, you can sort of stay true to yourself, be a good person and all of that. But yeah, you know, just understand the realities of the world, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah. And that's, that's also the challenge with uh, taking on commissions. And um, Michael John <laughs> Angel, uh, I love that man. He actually... He was one of the highest paid portrait painters in North America for a long time. Oh, wow. And he, yeah. And he, he knew how to handle like commissions. And I remember he would give us like a lecture every trimester to talk about that side, the business side of like taking on commissions specifically for portraiture. Cause that was what he knew. And one of the things he said was, you're going to get a lot of annoying rich people and they're going to want to put their dog or their yachts or their thing. Just do it. Just do it. It's going to be terrible. <laughs> You're going to feel like your life is like being sucked out of you. But <laughs> you got to you gotta do it. That is excellent advice. You're lucky that you got that early on. I wish I would mm -hmm. have. I learned that the hard way. But he's so right, you know, for sure. Yeah. So true. Yeah. And I mean, it's like if, uh, unfortunately, and I'm, uh, this is, this is so sad. But I'm going to compare it to like a contractor, right? You hire a contractor to do your kitchen or something. And like if he, if he does something and you want to change it, like he has to change it. The yeah. money part is the complicated part because, of course, I think a contractor would charge. But mm. yeah, I would think so. 
Well, I think there's a little bit of a misconception too that what we're doing is like, you know, more important than let's say like construction work. But sometimes it sometimes it isn't. I mean, I have another good friend of mine who's constantly humbling me. He's like, Derek, you're just doing glorified wallpaper for these people, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's you know, like I shouldn't. It's not such this like you know highfalutin thing. It can be between the two of them. I, it's decorative. You know, they're pretty pictures to hang on the wall. But of course, to us, to me, it's this deep, soulful experience. But yeah, I cannot, I can also not forget that, you know, I'm not like curing cancer with these paintings. They're still just paintings. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, again, there's like a balance there. But um, yeah, oh, God, don't want to get too hilarious. carried away. That's <laughs> hilarious. It's yeah, like I love it. I love it. custom wallpaper of an exact size <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh I love no it. he's a landscape painter his name is willow seaton he's the greatest guy like i love how he paints but he all he's the only person who i'll send my paintings to to critique because he mm. gives me the most honest opinions you know he doesn't spare my feelings at all which is so valuable i, I love that yeah you know, and that's yeah. another really great tip having um other artists in your life again networking um who you can trust to give you useful critiques that you know they might hurt but hey you can take it from them because you love them <laughs> yeah no it's so helpful it might be one of the most valuable things you can get I mean I to some extent you have to take it with a grain of salt because it's still somebody's opinion mm -hmm. but it's so helpful I am lucky to have a few people like that who will yeah without a without a question will point out you know stuff that's wrong or that I'm missing and uh and I always think yeah I'm so lucky to have that it is so valuable so yeah. it's a good thing and and a lot of those relationships did come through me taking a workshop with them and then you know we became friends so it's nice yeah it's nice to have those relationships it's helpful I completely agree and now I want to ask you do you have any upcoming shows or workshops or any cool stuff that's happening? No, oh, actually, there's a lot of uh, fun stuff coming up. One out in New York at the Salma Gundy Club is a show that opens April. It's with Vanessa Roth Fine Art. You know, she does her Americans in Paris mm -hmm. exhibitions. And this one's sort of a crossover between fine art and fashion. So that is, yeah, that's very exciting. I'm going to have four paintings in that. There's a, a cool ad about it in American Art Collector that comes out this month. And uh, yeah, I was happy that I got a full page in that with one of the pieces that's in the show. Yeah, yeah, very, very pleased with that. And then uh, the California Art Club out here, they do a show once a year called the Gold Medal Exhibition. And that's in July. So I'll have a piece there. And then I am doing a class at the Los Angeles Academy of Figurative Art in May and in June. Usually what I teach there is just the full-time program. But this class will be open to anybody. So, you know, if there's anybody in that neck of the woods, uh, you're free to um, join. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. And uh, where can people find your work? Well, my website's DerekHarrisonArt.com, which I should say the FASO website, I've had that for 10 years. It is amazing. Like, wow. I remember when I first got that website, I didn't have like a lot of money. So getting a website through a developer like that was a challenge, but they have that contest, the bold brush contest. And I got second place in that. And I think I got a free website for like a year. So that got things started. And um, it is, it is, I cannot recommend those highly enough because it makes it so easy for me to just upload work. I have a newsletter that connects all collectors and it's just the best. So that's a good place to go. And then, of course, my Instagram is at Derek Harrison Art. And I tend to respond to any and all DMs. So feel free to contact me anytime. And another thing, like if anybody's ever in Santa Barbara, California, which I know it's a smaller beach town up here, but I do have a live model who comes to sit on Sundays where I leave. It's open to anybody who wants to come paint. And a lot of you know great painters have been up here and uh, have painted along. So it's a fun experience, you know? So It's a networking ever... experience. <laughs> For sure, 100%. <laughs> yeah. It is. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Derek. Okay, yeah, thank you, Laura. It was great to talk to you. And uh, yeah. yeah, I love your work quite a bit. So 
it's thank my you. pleasure thank you your work is awesome too so it this was it, this was a really fun conversation thank you yeah yeah no it definitely was <laughs> yeah